Um, I have been invited today to come on here and to share my conversion story. Uh, thanks to Michael White for inviting me. He's a great guy. I uh, love that guy to death. But um, the reason that I'm here mainly is because I have a conversion story that's a little bit different. It is sort of abstract and abnormal. Um, but I am from Yakinville, North Carolina. Uh, so if I have a weird accent, I'm, I apologize. But uh, I grew up in a small town. I grew up in a Southern Baptist home. Uh, and I, I loved it. It was great. Uh, but I, I hit high school and... Um, I decided that it was time to, to do something for myself, to kind of veer away from uh, the, the Southern Baptist life. And I, of course, I lived with my grandparents, and they were very staunch Southern Baptist, very right down to the T. Uh, they taught me a lot of good morals, but it was time to move on for, for myself. And so, but uh, I had many different um, religions that I looked at, many different types of um, theories, uh, beliefs, systems, but nothing ever really seemed to, to fit. But I went through a period of time during this where I sort of fell away from the gospel. Uh, most young teens do. And in doing so, I, I got into some trouble. I, I definitely wasn't the best kid in the whole wide world, but I, uh, I, I, I made some mistakes that I definitely regret. And, and that's a different story for a different time. But um, I, I took theater. I got uh, in, in some trouble, and I wasn't able to play basketball. I got cut off the team, and um, I, I, I got put into a theater class in high school. And I, I absolutely loved theater. Uh, at first, I thought it was kind of weird because I was hanging out with a bunch of people. I didn't really know who they were. Um, it was just a strange, strange, strange community to be a part of, a uh, theater community. And so at first, I was going in with this big... Um, this big, bad uh, athlete attitude, you know, why am I in theater? I kind of got put in there on my own. And uh, I found out that I loved it. I found out that I would wake up every single morning and love going to theater class. It was the best. And so in 2011, the Book of Mormon on Broadway came out. And I can remember some of the, the people in theater talking about it. And but for whatever reason, um, we were just not, it was, it was supposed to be a, a pretty bad musical. And so the next thing I know is I was so interested, I went and I actually started listening to the music uh, online and I found that I was, that's all I was listening to. I became so obsessed with the musical, but I had never heard of a Mormon before, ever in my entire life that I ever heard of a Mormon. Uh, so this was a new thing to me, the word Mormon, right? Um, and so the next thing I know, I'm on a plane to New York. I am, I am all the way up in New York by myself. I think I'm 17 years old at this point. I don't remember why. I, it just came over me to make one of those hasty decisions to go up there. And I went and watched the musical. That was a very expensive, big penny out of my pocket to go watch that musical. Um, and I didn't know what was going on. I had no clue that this was religion. I had no clue that this was anything. But I can remember looking at the musical and watching it and thinking, my goodness, like this is the craziest thing I have ever heard of in my entire life. These people are so weird, right? I, it's so different from my Southern Baptist lifestyle, and the missionaries were so faithful, but it was like corny faithful. It was just, it was strange to me. Um, but uh, I, I left the, uh, the theater, and I, got, I hopped back on a plane. I came back to uh, Yakinville, uh, well, there in Charlotte, and I just became obsessed with I with this religion I I don't remember exactly what it was that came over me but all I could think about was just learning more about the religion that's all I wanted to do was learn more about the religion and so I I I went as far as stealing books out of the library uh, because the the librarian at the time would not allow me to check out Mormon books anything related to Mormonism she told me that I would go to hell I walked in with a with a backpack on and I I put it in my back pack and I left and I stole them. I've since repent, re re repented, so don't hold that against me, but uh, I did everything online, um, books, I mean, you, you name it, I was researching it and I can remember thinking, wow, this is the craziest thing, religion I've ever, I've ever came across. It's so abstract, so abnormal. Um, but I, I, I woke up one morning on a Sunday and, and I said, I, it's time to meet a Mormon because where I come from in my small little Southern Baptist County, you don't find Mormons where I come from. And, and so I said, it's time to, time to get up and go and find 
um, Mormons. And, I, and at the time, I think it was the Holy Ghost that was prompting me to do it, but it wasn't. But I, I just felt, I felt overwhelmed to go and do it. And uh, so I called a friend up, and, and her and I got into a car. She, I don't remember if she was atheist. I think she was atheist. Uh, but so I didn't have any biased opinions here. And we got in the car, and we went down to, um, to the local Mormon church, which was probably about 25 to 30 miles. So that's, that's the nearest one to where I was. And, um, and so I, I got off the car, and I, I just, we just walked into the church with no expectations. This is the same year that Mitt Romney was running for president, so he sort of intrigued me a little bit. No expectations, just, just me, just me and Candace, just there. And we walked in, and we, uh, I can remember walking in, and all of these people were just smiling. I, I, I had never seen that before. I had never seen just a group of people that were so happy about something. But they just, just these corny, big, cheesy smiles sitting in, in this big room and all these speakers and people in ties. And it was, it was, it felt, it felt warm and it felt welcoming. And I sat in the back and, um, and Candace and I sat in the back and we, we sat there and we, and we made it through the whole, whole, um, the whole sacrament meeting and, and I can uh, remember someone turning around and shaking my hand and asking me, where are you from? What, why are you here? What ward are you from? And the word ward, I never heard of that word before. And uh, I said, I'm from Yakinville and I don't know what a ward is. I, I'm, I'm just here, I'm Southern Baptist, to, just, just to learn about Mormons. And this guy's eyes like got real big and looked at me and it was almost like he uh, just struck gold and uh, and the sisters wasn't too far away from them. <laughs> the, they were just probably perping kitty corner to where I was, and uh, and he immediately like looked at them. He went and got them, and they br and he he brought them over to me, or they, he brought the sisters over to me, and uh, and they just like once I told them that I was just here to learn, which is like a missionary's. Um, that never happens as a missionary. I served a mission. That that never happens as a missionary. Just someone showing up. Uh, these two sisters looked like they were getting ready to feast on me. They, they literally looked like they were going to just hound me. It was amazing. I'd never seen uh, just two just shocked faces the way that it was. And so I, uh, we learned, and uh, we learned together. They got my number, which was a big mistake because sisters are very good. They are very uh, diligent in all that they do. They would text me every single day uh, wanting, to, wanting to meet, and finally I, I decided to meet with them. But not before I announced to my grandparents that I was going to do it, and um, I started facing some adversity uh, with um, my family, with the community, uh, with uh, just different various religious leaders in the area, and I started to get um, attacked on a, on a very uh, verbal level. level. Uh, and um, there, was some, there, was, there was a time where I was actually asked to leave the house uh, for uh, a time. Uh, because I was associating with Mormons, um, and this was after I uh, had decided to become baptized. Uh, but I, I met with those sisters; um, they were great sisters. I, I love them to death. Um, but uh, I met with them every week at McDonald's and a couple times at Arby's, and uh, and they they decided to have me get baptized. And that's whenever, of course, I told my grandparents that I was going to do that. And and I went through some trials. I went through some struggles because I was I was um, I was a part of this you know, cult, and and that was awfully rough for me. Um, but for whatever reason, I can just remember thinking, like as crazy as this is, as crazy as what I'm doing, it j it just felt right, right? I don't I don't think I ever had um, was able to feel the Holy Ghost, and I, I didn't know what it was. But I think the Holy Ghost was in the back of my head just telling me to keep going, that even though it's hard right now, even though you're, you're kind of getting some, some flack from it. Even at school, I was getting the flack at school. Uh, and my, my, my family and uh, my community, it, it, was, it was pretty rough. Uh, but I, kept, I knew to keep going. I knew to keep um, true to what I was doing because it just felt right. And so uh, I got baptized. And I remember walking down into the waters. And I can remember going down in there and looking out and, and seeing my family there. And they were there to support me. Uh, my grandma in particular was the one that really gave me the most flack. Um, she gave me the hardest time. And we, and we scrapped uh, through, that, through, through the whole process, we scrapped. And we, 
and we argued. And but in the end, she was there to support me, and that was what was important to me is that she was there to support me. Um, but um, I got baptized, and uh, it was it was just scary to be a part of a congregation that that I I didn't know anyone really in reality. But I made friends over the over the a course of about a year. I decided that I wanted to go on a mission, um, and. Uh, and remember, all this is just stemming from the Book of Mormon on Broadway, right? The Lord uses his, uh, he uses anything he possibly can to bring about his work. I have a, a firm testimony of that. But all this from the Book of Mormon on Broadway, I can remember thinking, wow, I want to be a missionary just like those guys in the Book of Mormon on Broadway. And so I put in my papers a year later. I got my call to Argentina where I flew to Provo about three months later after I got my call. I, uh, and then I learned a little bit of Spanish. And then I went down to Argentina, um, and I faced some serious trials. I, even though I was going off of all of this, um, uh, this, this, this want to be a missionary, I realized I didn't have a firm testimony. I realized that it was tough testifying to something that you didn't know was true. And I got down there, and I picked up some, some different various things, uh, medical, medical things, and I realized that I was testifying to something that I didn't even know was true. And so I decided to go back home. And I got home, I kind of regrouped, and I decided that I want to go back out on a mission. And so I got a recall to the Washington Kennewick mission, where I flew there. After I got the call, I left four days, four or five days later. Um, I flew out to Washington, where I currently am right now. I got out here and found that I was still having some issues, where I, again, decided to fly back home three more months into my mission. Um, and then I got home. I spent 10 months at home. Um, I moved to Arizona. I made some really great friends down there. I moved to Provo, and I made some even better friends up there. And then uh, about 10 months later, yeah, t yeah 10 months, I, I got down there, and I remember looking at my phone, and it was my mission president. And he, he told me, he said, Elder Hutchins, it's been 10 months, and, um, but I, I just felt a prompting that you need to come back to the mission. And so once again, uh, and this is a, a long story for a different time, but uh, once again, I was on a plane back to the Kennewick Mission for the third time, starting my mission. Goodness gracious. And then um, I got up here, and for the first time in my entire mission, I, um, I, everything was going great. Everything was going awesome. And on preparation day, on P-Day, uh, I went up for a shot uh, in basketball, and I came down and I broke my ankle. And I... I can remember just thinking, my goodness, when is this ride ever going to end? This is the, and this is a, this mission was, it was nuts. It, it, it wasn't right. It seemed like from the, the very beginning of my conversion that I had just saw this, all this adversity and all this trial. And I came down, broke my ankle, and probably three or four days later, I was back on a plane uh, to Provo, to, to Provo. And I was off my mission. And I did not want to go back whatsoever. I had no inclination. I had no desire to want to go back. I was done. I didn't want to go back. Uh, but I ended up going back. I ended up finishing up my mission. Um, it, it was a tough decision. Again, different story for a different time. But um, I finished my mission about four months ago. And I'm excited that I did it. I'm excited that I served a mission. I'm excited that even though I faced adversity, even though I saw adversity, I was able to, to do it the, the Lord's will. And, and just to finish, I... I, I want to testify, and I want to just share a scripture, um, as I've shared my story here of um, of hardships and, and of afflictions, because we as human beings have them every single day, every single day. Um, uh, Paul, my favorite, he's one of my he's he's my guy, the Apostle Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul had an affliction of his, of his own, the the great missionary that he was, and and he speaks of this affliction. And, uh, and he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So he had some sort of a, an infirmity or something going on with him. And the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And he asked God three different times to take it away from him. Three different times to take it away from him. But yet it just it never went away. And then Paul goes on to say, And the Lord said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, 
in persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Brothers and sisters, I have a very firm testimony of adversity and of grace. And I, I know that it is essential to our, our well-being, it is essential to us growing, to us making it to a higher level as human beings. We cannot, we cannot sit stagnant. We cannot be just sitting stationary. And I know that as adversity comes, even though it may be hard, even though you may face adversity, I know without a shadow of a doubt that that adversity is, is there to help you. And the Lord has a plan for you. Oh my goodness, he has a plan for you. And don't ever doubt that. Even though you may seem like you're at the lowest point of your life, and you may seem like the world is against you. I know that. I know the Lord has a plan for you. And I know that he loves you so unconditionally. And even though it might seem hard, just trust in the Lord, as Proverbs tells us. And just know that his grace, that Christ's atonement, can help you be made perfect, can help you in your weakness, and he can help you come to a level and be at a level that you never could imagine possible. Brothers and sisters, trust in the Lord. I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. I know that he was. And I know the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church and the true kingdom here on earth of God himself. I say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.